for my own research, you know. They have a little fine, you know. They have the uh, fake ID, the ID of DP, you know, you know you're smiling, you, you know that, you know. That doesn't appear primarily in the testimonies uh, because this is the visual archives, you know, the visual culture. Um, and um, so when they show the photo, uh, it depends because sometimes the photo is not the photo of the exhumation itself, it's the photo taken years later of the grave or of the memorial. I'm just curious, what did you expect from coming to the Visual History Archive? What did you think you would find? I, I expected examples. You know, very often those archives are used by old-fashioned and aging people like me. You know, after 80%, I mean, after years of research in our archives, and then we have, we put at the end of the chapter, you know, it works. An example taken for this. It's not the way I, I came, you know, to be frank. You know, I came not, not, expect, not knowing, you know. A bit worried, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling. I must say. I'm not very um, as certain of, you know, the reading, the finding, um, because it's not the way I worked. You know, I always worked with archives. I must say, I must confess that before, when I got the letter, uh, from from you, Mara, from from Wolf saying, you know, congratulations, you won the award. Uh, um, I, I went back to my uh, PhD, and I counted how many interviews I had done, <laughs> and I realized I'd, I'd done 25. As all archives, you know, all history. You know. But I never worked on oral history. Interviews, I. I did not construct myself. You know. It's a different way because when I work on the banks, you know, I interviewed the owners or the family, but I knew exactly what I needed from them. You know. So uh, still, I'm, I'm still unstable. It's good, no? That's what research is made of. <laughs> Stability. No, my my biggest surprise, and and I would say. Uh, Satisfaction, if we can be satisfied working with such a material, are the photos. They really are we really amazing. And the you know, many discovered the liberator, you know, the uh, and and the DPs, you know. So, oh god, I missed the story <laughs> of the DPs, you know, and uh, I need to add a chapter in my book, you know. <laughs> Which is also the role of these interviews, you know. Uh, because I tell my students, I say yeah, also, the interviews will tell stories that have not been written. <laughs> but it's a lot of work to find them. OK, my last impression before uh, thanking you is, uh, of course, I have my, you know, my own feeling towards those uh, interviews. It's very strange to work because you know, I search exhumation. So I, I open, you know, I click on the, the image. And I don't know what to expect. I don't know the fate. I don't search Auschwitz survivor. You know. And I, rem I realized that I had this anxiety. You know, I see the face, and you relate to the face immediately. We are all across colors. And I, say, I hope she didn't survive Auschwitz. I hope she didn't. You know. And I was scrolling you know, in the biographies. You know, it's very well, so minutiously made. I say, oh, she was in hiding. You remember this very strange feeling, you know. Oh, I'm so glad she was in hiding. You know, she didn't go to a, go through a camp, you know. <coughs> so it, it's sort of an interesting uh, intimacy with the with the survivors. Okay, okay then I think uh, we all have to thank John Mark. I'm the uh, director of the USC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. 
And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last event of the semester. And this, uh, it is our uh, distinct pleasure to have our current center fellow for this academic year presenting about the research he is doing uh, during his uh, residency. Um, Jean-Marc Dreyfus is a very old friend of mine. I sh should reveal this, right? <laughs> Full disclosure, so we met in 2000, 2000 actually, right, at a conference in Constance uh, where, and I think this is kind of accompanying both our ways, uh, which was the first conference, interdisciplinary conference on perpetrators in the Holocaust uh, in Germany. And um, so we kind of uh, clicked and since then we are uh, colleagues and good friends. And uh, he is currently reader uh, in Holocaust studies at the University in Manchester, UK. Uh, he got his PhD in history from the University uh, of Paris I, Pantheon Sorbonne. Um, and he is uh, one of the most uh, renowned scholars of uh, the Holocaust in France. He writ has written uh, uh, on a very kind of broad range of different aspects, uh, and I have to say unknown aspects of the persecution of the Jews in France, from Aryanization uh, of Jewish property to uh, forced labor of Jews in uh, France. Uh, but he has also, and this is why I mentioned interdisciplinarity, he is not just working as an historian. He always has a kind of a, uh, an eye for literature, uh, testimony, and so he is. Uh, he edited, uh, for example, uh, a diary um, uh, beyond just publishing academic books. And um, most recently, he kind of uh, started to uh, into an interdisciplinary endeavor, looking into what happens with human remains uh, of mass violence. And part of this is what he is presenting today, focusing on the Holocaust. But in this project, it's much wider, a much wider range, looking into other genocides and other instances of mass violence. He, uh, for his research, and uh, he got uh, a lot of awards and uh, fellowships, for example, at Harvard University Center for European Studies, the Center Mark Bloch in Berlin, the Yad Vashem Center for International Holocaust Studies, and naturally, uh, last but not least, also the Holocaust Museum in um, DC. He has published uh, several books, I think seven now, or eight? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he, he doesn't even uh, can, uh, count them anymore because he's publishing so, at such a speed, and, but they are all, it's not kind of, they are really substantial work, so I don't know how he does this. Um, he is so productive. One of the uh, books uh, I want to mention is Looting by Decrease, the Despoilment of Jewish-Owned Banks in France and Their Restitutions. Uh, I mentioned already uh, forced labor, Nazi labor camps in Paris. Then um, he also um, worked on documents, uh, a, a kind of uh, publishing documents. For example, the la most recent one is the Goering catalog. Um, so he looked also into uh, looting of arts. So you see, this is a really uh, a broad range scholar. And so I really, uh, it's my uh, great and sincere pleasure to have him here. Uh, speaking to you. I hand over to you, John Mark. So, thank you, Rolf, for the, this, this wonderful presentation. In fact, my secret is that I'm trying to publish as many books as Wolf does. You know, <laughs> we, we compete. We compete, you know, you know, boys. Um, <laughs> okay, um, thank you for being here. Uh, the topic of today is not an easy one, if there is such a thing as an easy topic in the field of the Holocaust. Um, I'm a bit nervous, yes, I am, because I'm presenting this, this really new research that is not finished, so first results. So be compassionate to me, you know, if you don't feel that it's a, an achieved um, uh, research, I still have uh, five weeks or six weeks here. Um, second, I don't do that normally, but uh, trigger warning, yes. Um, few of the photos, few of the, of the photos, the photographs that I will show you are difficult. 
So um, when I organized the conferences on this topic that Wolf described, described corpses of mass violence and genocide, we organized many conferences, workshops. We had the habit to leave the door open, saying, you know, go out if you feel that it's overwhelming. It will not be overwhelming, I, I'm sure, but trigger warning, some of the photos that I will explain um, are uh, difficult. I want to thank all the members, uh, the team of you know, USC, Shoah Foundation, Holocaust Visual Archives, my friends, <laughs> ladies, <laughs> we, we work together in the same uh, office, and I have my own office, no, but <laughs> and we, we can watch at each other through the, the glass door. It has, been a, it has been a pleasure. Really, thank you for, for your help, you know, uh, uh, that really helped me to, to navigate uh, through this um, these mass of testimonies. You know, as you know, uh, Holocaust historians, they, they love the, those testimonies. They hate them at the st same time. We still struggle to find a way uh, it's, it's overwhelming, it's fascinating, uh, it's unexpected. That's what I want to say. I, I didn't expect to find what I will present uh, today. 13th of November, very important date in France. Uh, uh, French, uh, um, Midburg. <laughs> Here, uh, you know, it was the first uh, major terror attack uh, three years ago. You will realize why I mention it. Um, it's because when the second anniversary, that was last year, was um, organized, there was a week of um, excellent documentaries, radio documentaries, and it was the main uh, broadcasting on history. It was France um, Culture in the morning from 9 to 10, and you know. Uh, it's a history broadcast, you know, that you know, everybody listened to. And it was a week of, you know, the first testimonies. And the first um, broadcast on the Monday, I remember it very, very, very uh, vividly. The first broadcast on the Monday was not on the victims and the survivors of the terror attack in Paris. It was about us about interviews of the Holocaust. So I was, I've been interviewed at length with many people who have worked here, who have worked on this material. So, you know, tell us, you know, who you are, you know, you are familiar with this material, you know, interviewing, dealing with interviews of the survivors, of liberators, you know. Tell us how you feel. So the, we were interviews as interviewers for the first time. That was a very interesting uh, moment to s make a link. So this is, uh, it works, so for many efforts, I hope so. so. Okay, very briefly, I'm watching the time. Um, I will present you where I come from. So this major research program that is officially over, uh, that I started uh, yeah, 2012, but you know, application, the time to get the answer. We started in 2011, co uh, that uh, we named Corpses of Mass Violence and Genocide. With my uh, partner in crime, Elizabeth Onstedt, who is a, an anthropologist, and it's very important. She's a, non, a, a social, social anthropologist. She's a student of Levi Strauss, um, at, um, and she is a sociologist, an anthropologist at the memory of the Gulag, so not the Holocaust. And we have started this project with a simple idea is that when you deal with mass violence and genocide, we don't want to enter into the differentiation. You know, what is a genocide? So that's why we use these generic terms, those generic terms. 
Today, in the research, you have the impression that those mass violence and genocide of the 20th century, and we know how many there were, you know, the dimension of the 20th century, the, the, the century of genocide, we have the impression <coughs> that <coughs> they produced mostly memorials. And as you know, the Shoah Foundation was created as a memorial and trauma. But no, the first production of mass violence and genocide, they were corpses, dead bodies. And you can imagine how many, the quantity. So we wanted to go back to the, the physicality, the materiality of horror, of terror, of crimes, and to see if changing the angles will permit us to bring new insights, new knowledge new analysis on this uh, phenomenon. So I will very briefly, and really sorry, I will go very fast on the first slides, present you really, really roughly this project that was financed by Brussels, by the European Union. You know, as you may know, there are a lot of the financing of the research today in Europe, post including post-Brexit Europe, is not national. Uh, it's, uh, it's financed directly by, it's a pot of money that will be spent within the, the European Union. So we got a very generous grant. And that's the, the nice logo that we presented. OK, the main objective, so uh, we didn't want to be exhaustive. We wanted a qualitative approach. We wanted a comparative approach, and we wanted to be multidisciplinary. Uh, many questions, you know, um, very social sciences, you know, and three main issues that we differentiate, and it's still valid for my own thinking. The moment of what we call the destruction, how are the dead bodies treated in the moment of the crime? Second. After the crime is over, <coughs> the period that what we call identification, search and identification. The cases in which the, uh, who, I, I will, will understand, you know, more, who, who did that, you know, wanted to look for the corpses, all human remains, all ashes. I wrote extensively on ashes of the Holocaust. Um, and in some cases, identification to put a name. The naming is so important. We know that as Holocaust scholars. It's an obsession in, within the Jewish world, you know, the naming, giving the names. You think of Yad Vashem, you know, trying to collect the names of the six million victims. And finally, a, a phase, third phase that we named in a very awkward way, reconciliation, but we don't like the term anymore. It will be a, a peaceful re-inscription of the corpses or the dead bodies or the body parts or the ashes or the human remains into a pacified, democratized society. Very ambitious. And we're very, we're very um, cautious about the, the term. So we had uh, a team, you know, very rapidly. History, that's me, uh, archaeology, forensic studies, which is a field in itself. In, in the UK, you have chairs of forensic studies, law, criminology, and anthropology. Um, very fruitful. We traveled the world, the seven seas, and we visited many sites of mass grave, which is something I find very important, the afterlife of mass graves. And they had, and they ha are having, a very complex afterlife, the mass graves. I mean, to make something like uh, a bit, a bit humorous, you know, if I could, no, corpses, they move a lot, or they are moved a lot. And which field, which discipline took the upper hand from the beginning, this project, finally, we, we ended up working with probably 100 different scholars, yeah. anthropology. Clearly, and it's not because Elizabeth is a very strong personality. And <laughs> it, it really, it's, it, 
why? Because anthropology, they have a lot, anthropologists have a lot to tell us about death, funerary rituals, burials, etc. I mean, if for the uh, anthropologists in the room, you know, I would say that modern anthropology in the 19th century, in Britain, the United States, and <coughs> France, was invented in studying funerary rituals. Things of Malinowski, even Margaret Mead, etc., etc. And historians, we had, you know, we are always kind of following the band Wagen. Um, the phase of destruction. Uh, the idea is that when the crime, the people are dead, are being killed, the crime is not over. There is a specific treatment of the corpses. In the case of the Holocaust, you know, of course, gas chambers integrated to the crematoria, but we know also about the Operation 1005, 1005, which was for the Nazi to come back to the place of places of the crime, exhume, you know, during the Holocaust, and burn the corpses in order to erase evidence. Uh, so corpses are as evidence, very important. And then the, the human imagination is endless about the treatment of those corpses. Could be dismantled, hidden, put in water, put in the desert cut into pieces, traded, um, use as trophy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is Bergen-Belsen, of course. Uh, a lot could be, could be told about those images. Then we had the phase of search and ident identification. And we in unexpectedly, we were drawn to, towards Spain. What is this map? This is the official map of the mass graves today in Spain, and they are the mass graves of the Spanish Civil War, 36, 39, it's not just, just before the Holocaust. As you know, the corpses of the Francoist uh, have been exhumed, treated, honored, etc., but not the corpses of the Republicans. So those are officially the mass graves of the Republican. But there has been a movement that we named forensic term, which is that the family started 15 years ago, made a, a civil movement, grassroots, to say it's time for us to recover the corpses of our grandparents or great grandparents, sometimes the parents, uh, and opening the mass graves. 300,000 are still on the ground. Less than 6,000 have been exhumed. Uh, forensic anthropologists, visual studies, historian, you know, say so when there is an exhumation today in Spain, you have a team, a world around the grave. Fascinating. The journalists, the family, the, the photogra photographers, the scholars. And finally, reconciliation, human remains society. I don't know if you're familiar with those photos. So we're in Yash. And in 2010, um, November, a mass grave was discovered. OK, that's the official narrative. Suddenly, mass grave of the, you know, victims of this major massacre pogrom in Yas, in Romania, uh, several dozens of, um, of, uh, of corpses. What was interesting is that the government, the Romanian government, took it over. And at the diplomatic level, very high diplomatic level, asked what to do. So they asked what to do with the Jewish Law, the halacha. So rabbis from the United States and from London, ultra Orthodox rabbi, came to Yash and they exhumed and then they reburied the corpses into the Jewish cemetery. Fascinating, it was documented, uh, photographed. So that was a, 
an example, a case study that triggered our interest. And I will talk about the temporality of examination. Some, a few of our publications, there are more, and in more. I left the, the photo about Guatemala. You know what's going on, Guatemala, it was a genocide mass violence, 200,000 people. Recovery of the corpses, and you have this kind of ceremony, the community, you know, m making, organizing the funeral postponed. They do years after what should have been done in the case of natural deaths. Why Guatemala? Because we have Guatemala in our database, database you know, of testimony. Photocarry, so that's we, this is also well studies, studied. Uh, 11th of July, every year. So you have the collective uh, burial of the remains of the victims of Srebrenica, uh, the, the massacre of Srebrenica, um, the same day, the remains of the the victims that have been identified in the in the previous year, you know, with this massive organization that was financed, has been financed for years by the State Department, U.S. State Department directly. Now the the financing has been diversified. You know, the International Commission for Missing Persons uh, wanting to identify the three hundred thousand victims of this war in Bosnia. And that is qualified as genocide by International Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, so this is a fascinating exercise, but it's to um, just trigger your, your interest into my, my own research. And I like the, the fact that it's, again, you know, publicized. You, know, you, you see pictures of Potokari every year in the New York Times or Non mainstream press. You know. Cultural study, you know, I mean, this is Ida. I always refer to Ida, to the film, uh, because what is described in this film, this movie that won the Academy Award a um, few years ago, the 2013, for a you know, foreign film, what is described is extraordinarily close to what I have found in the visual archives. So the story of the, so she was a baby, became a Catholic nun, she's a sister, she became a communist, the recent fighter, an uh, general attorney, you know, uh, and they go to the forest, so it's the encounter, we're in the early 60s, and they will, with the help of a local farmer, that they pay, it's very important, they will exhume the remains of their parents. I mean, the, the, so the brother, sister-in-law, and <coughs> her parents that have been killed by local Polish farmers, buried in the forest, and they will just put them, and it's very graphic, they just put them in the Jewish cemetery. Um, this example I find extraordinarily interesting too. Uh, it's the treatment of rem human remains as a memorial, a memorial object. Uh, I don't know if you know these, uh, these stories. So that was a column that was built in the time Maidanek was in use, you know, as a mixed camp, concentration and death camp. And the Polish workers, artists, who were forced to build the column, you know, they buried under the column some ashes taken from the crematoria. Uh, so in the time of the destruction itself, they had a, a gesture of commemoration using some human remains. And there is a plaque in three languages explaining this story. Memorbourg, uh, we, we worked a lot with the Yiskorbourg, it's called Bicher written by the community. And if you read them again closely, you find 
that kind of photos, it's very blurred, I'm sorry, uh, exhumations, mass exhumations that happen right, right after the liberation. This is the book I'm writing at the moment uh, because it's so huge, so I needed to refocus. It's a French national mission. Vive la France. Uh, interesting because it was a national, it was an offspring of the very official French Ministry for Veterans and War Victi Victims, you know, from 1945, headed this mission by Mr. Garbon, which is totally unknown. There's not one time, one document, his um, name is printed. And he was in charge from 1946 till 1964, so it lasted long. He was in charge of going to Germany and Eastern Europe and trying to exhume and identify the French corpses, all the corpses of the people deported from France, which was co of course covered a huge variety of cases from resistance fighters to Polish Jews, Spanish Republican to monarchist uh, nationalist. The mission exhumed 50,000 corpses, identified 7,000 as French, deported in French, ret repatriated 4,000 to France, and claimed to have had an identification rate from one mass grave to the other between 70 and 91 percent. So this is a bit of the kind of material I study. You know, they were doing the kind of archaeological um, research, you know, and identification. And this is where the corpses arrive. This is the Struthof, not the Struthof, the Struthof camp. Uh, and you have a national necropolis built on the exactly like a World War I military cemetery, but they were all deportees, you know, including many Jews. And that's something that is absolutely not known, that many, uh, many, a few dozens of French Jews deported from France you know, are buried here in the Vosges, in this memorial. OK, so uh, of course I was too long, but you know we started late, very late. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So I studied uh, six, I mean, I found, I, I selected, I kept 63 testimonies from the uh, visual archives. In fact, I, I um, came through more, more than that, but some didn't qualify for my research because uh, the link was broken or because I went to exhumation and, you know, at the segment, as we called, where the, I should have a um, narrative of exhumation, there was no narrative of exhumation. Or because the um, survivor had a fascinating story, but was not Jewish. And here I'm dealing with the Holocaust, and we're focusing on, on the Holocaust. So my first question, uh, and I will repeat it, you know, and I cannot conclude, is the dimension. Are the 63 testimonies the only one we could find describing exhumations? Or are there many more in this, this huge database? 52,000, huh? just for the Holocaust, about. Are there many more? But for various reasons, they are, are under the radar. Why would they be under the radar? First, because they are not, or the exhumations are not indexed, question mark. I, d I don't know. They are not indexed because the term, I have, there are two terms I use, you know, reburial and mass grave exhumations. And one of the terms has been introduced in the, the list, indexing list, only in 2002, which is very late. Main, a lot of indexing has been made before that. 
So this is a possibility that you have many more, but we cannot find them that easily. I mean, many other, maybe other ways, but I couldn't find them very easily. Or maybe there were many more stories of exhumation, but uh, they were not told. Because the survivors, for many reasons we can discuss, didn't tell. They find, didn't find it interesting. For sure, they were not asked. Uh, it's not a criticism of any kind. They were not asked. And they were not asked for a good reason, because when we face the Holocaust, facing is a difficult term, because the more the older I grow, the more difficult I find it to face, you know, still, still, uh, the more you work, the more you think you approach the Holocaust, the more distant it, it appears. Uh, dimension of the catastrophe. Um, the, we think immediately that there were no corpses. Corpses have been burned. Auschwitz, crematoria. Why look for the corpses on exhumation? when we know they have been burned. This is the immediate image we have of the Holocaust. Um, but there were many more corpses left, or human remains, and we will try to figure out. So I sorted them in so 15 interviews of liberators. That was a surprise, but should it be a surprise, knowing that the liberators that were inter interviewed there I think they were selected as good witnesses because they had open concentration camps. Uh, that's why they have been interviewed. And in the moment, the, the you know when the Allies opened the gates, you know, uh, etc. All those books that we have read about the encounter between the al Allies, not only the Americans, also the Allies um, of many national. Encountered the camps, the famous photos, Bergen-Belsen, you have seen one. Um, there has been a very complex process. There a complex process of burying the corpses, but also of exhuming. Same moment. And this is not described. And we have, I have a lot of you know, documentation. The moment they arrived, they were looking for evidence. So again, we have the corpses as evidence for future trial. And some of the liberators were in the war crime units. That's why they had to deal with the uh, trial. Then we have 10 exhumations in the time of the Holocaust. I will give you examples. And 38, that what I call the Ida, you know, that the film kind, after the Holocaust. So liberator. Um, we are, I don't know which slide it is, it is 18. Uh, example of Robert Powers, number 55,171. Landsberg, he was a radio team. When I hit this camp, we were ready, prepared to bury them, to treat them with dignity. People around said they did not know, but they could smell. I'm, I'm really quoting what was said, you know, in a colloquial. They had to cooperate. There are men in the back. How many people survived in the camp? I don't know. They were Jewish prisoners. Many have been castrated. Strange. But no, we have a lot of the reference in testimony that you know don't don't really fit our historical knowledge. They used those people as slaves in their home, etc. So huge mass graves have been dug in, about six to eight feet deep. Village people were lined up to look at the grave. So this is the forced viewing by the local German population. And he shows and insists on this photo. And you have the mayor of the, of the village, you know, forced to carry, and you see the to carry, to sort the corpses. And at that moment, it's not a matter of burying the corpses. It's a matter of sorting the dead from the living. And Robert insists, and he shows a drawing. It's not him, you know. And he sees that it shows the same, the photo. It's the same guy with the heart 
Karen. Okay. What he describes, and that's something I found, you know, co corroborate my research, is that those Germans, civil population, were forced to do the work without wearing gloves. They were, it was forbidden for th to them to, to wear the gloves. They needed to have a physical contact with the dead, which the forensic and the Americans would never do. Uh, always have, the, have the, the gloves on. Next example, liberation of Nordhausen, that has been, I mean, it's known as a it's confrontation with the concentration camps. And John Singheim um, was an ambulance, and he described uh, this sorting of the of the corpses. Six guys with an ambulance were going to do some work in that camp. They give us each a flashlight. We did not know why, because it was light. It was the time. I saw it, this long trench with hundreds of bodies in it, 50, 60, 70 feet long, as we approach the buildings there. Find which one is alive. I repeat, find which one is alive. Putting a, putting a lamp in their eye, sees the eyes is, eye is constricted to put them in an ambulance. If still alive, the dead we let on the ground. A big task so that the head solicited the man in the camp to help. So survivors themselves were, were asked to deal with the corpses, sorting and then burying them. And you see here that is described a woman collapsing because she has recognized one of her close loved one, we don't know, among the, the corpses. So that's him, and uh, he's posing you know, in, the, in the camp. So exhumation during the Holocaust. We have several cases. Most of they were massacred in 1939 or 1940, when the Germans arrived with their uh, collaborators. We'll not enter into the uh, controversy and details, but you know, the first shooting, the moment the German attacked Poland, and then the moment the German rule stabilized over Poland, you had some massacre shooting, but not systematic. It was before the systematic killing and sometimes even before the ghettoization. And in those cases, um, so I have Israel Green in Hungarian World Battalion. So this is another case, the Jews in the World Battalion with rabbis. So they could bury and sometimes exhume the corpse to put them in a Jewish cemetery. Uh, and sometimes the Jewish community, again, we in 1939, 40, beginning of 41, the Jewish community, local Jewish community, managed sometimes to get the permission to exhume and to put the corpse into the, the Jewish cemetery. In those cases, so 15, I have both hearsay and both direct witnesses, witnessing from, from these testimonies, uh, which I don't have for the post-exhumation. It's always direct witnesses. Um, Example of Marietta Road, ghetto the uh, Budapest ghetto. The grandmother dies in the ghetto during the the siege. Um, the bury, I don't know where, but probably in the gardens, public gardens were used as cemetery um, at that time, including during the siege of, uh, of Budapest. After the war, survivors were looking, exhuming the corpse of mama to put her into uh, the Jewish cemetery. Um, then we have um, first shooting. The devil took me. The SS did not take me. A lot of people, Jewish, they told me to dig a grave. That was in 1939. In 1940, the Jewish community asked for the permission to dig up those people. Sometimes they paid the local uh, Zippo SD, OSS. They got the permission with caskets 
we had to cover with like ah, and then there is an, a word I could not understand because of the smell. So you have this materiality, this yeah, the, the the effects linked to the the corpses that um, emerge very very strongly from the testimonies. So the smell, the the touch, the touching, the impression, you know, when touching the corpses, uh, etc. This is very very. Uh, vivid in the testimonies. Then we have the most, the case, the individual exhumations. So when I say individual exhumations, they are the exhumations made by individuals. Ida, my case, the film, watch the movie. Um, after the Holocaust, example of the, no, I have all the, the quotes, but example from the Lodz Ghetto, survivors from the Lodz Ghetto, or Lodz Ghetto and Auschwitz, uh, come back. And you know, at the beginning of the Lodz Ghetto, there were individual graves. Uh, and she remembers, so there is the, the story. She remembers where it was. She, there was even an inscription on the grave. And she had the, um, her mother, uh, her father, exhumed at that time. And we don't know where the corpse go, went no? from the Lodz Ghetto. Sometimes we don't have the end of the story because the interviewers doesn't know what to ask. You know, I have some cases, or we have the, the the survivors going, telling, you know, we went to the forest, we dug, we did not find, we tried again, five meters away, and then I realized that we don't have the, the we don't have the end of the story. We don't know if the corpse was found or, or not because the interviewer didn't insist. I mean, it's not judgmental. Maybe for the interviewer, it was too painful, too difficult. I've never seen any attempt of taking photos of those exhumed corpses. Oh. Wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
So they didn't get individual graves, but they got individual coffins. The rabbis uh, um, and a ceremony. And this is the same, I'm talking, and you have uh, survivors very proudly, you know, taking part of the exhumation and re, re, uh, reburial of uh, inauguration of the memorial. I have a second case, I will not detail, of uh, survivors themselves, you know. Uh, the date is not sure, uh, according to the survivors. It's quite soon, it could be 47, 48, after the Holocaust. Religious practice, rituals, and the presence of a rabbi, you know, was the halacha, the Jewish law that is so strict in dealing with corpses, was it implemented? So to my surprise, I found in all my notes of the 63 interviews that a rabbi is mentioned 34 times. It's a lot. I mean, in some interviews it's mentioned several times, so it's not half of the interviews, but it's much more than what I expected. It doesn't mean that a rabbi was present, but it means that the reference to the, what should be done, even among secular Jews, is mentioned in the, in the um, testimony. Even for the very secular survivors having a loose knowledge of the religious funeral rituals, the confrontation with tradition is present in the testimony. So we have a ver variety of cases. It goes from the organization of the exhumation and reburial by rabbis himself, so, such as the case told by Shmuel Strolli uh, in Romania, when it went up to Alexander Shafran, who was the chief rabbi in Romania before he um, emigrated to, uh, to Geneva, uh, giving the instruction you know, and of the hier hierarchy of the rabbi, um, organizing, and it goes to the refusal of rabbis to mingle into this exhumation in the name of Jewish law. For example, Alina Noya survived the Warsaw ghetto and knew where the grave of her sister was because the sister had died on her way to Sweden. They were evacuated and was buried in Lübeck. And she said, I made several attempts to transfer the corpse to Sweden, but the rabbi did not accept due to the uncertainty about the identity of the individual in the grave. And she shows a photo of the grave. So this case, I found it fascinating because the lady, I know her, <laughs> found out, you know, exhumation, and this is Madame Debré. I remember her when I was a kid. She's from Strasbourg. So I called my mother and said, who was Madame Debré? I remember her. So if you're in contact with my mother, you please mention that I mentioned her in this talk, OK? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> More seriously, uh, this is fascinating because her brother, Jacques Felba, was a noted, very promising mathematician. Uh, he was deported as a recent fighter, identified as a Jew, to Auschwitz, went through the selection, uh, went through, etc., the various camps, and finally died in the uh, camp of Ganaker, Ganaker, which is a was a, a commando of Flossenburg. The corpse was exhumed by my French Mission Garbon, officially, you know, identifying. And uh, they contacted the family. And she remembered, she said, it's fascinating, this example. She said, uh, I was contacted. She, she was a very fond of her brother. She mourned her brother for her entire life. Uh, Madame, uh, Madame Debré, born Felbao. And uh, uh, she said, yeah, she wanted the corpse back, and she went to the chief rabbi of Strasbourg, Rabbi Deutsch, and she said in the testimony, uh, I went to see the rabbi Deutsch. The, the Jewish community was not in favor of the transfer. I went to, I went to see the, the rabbi Deutsch. He opposed the transfer because the identity of the corpse was not certain, again. You know. So they were not sure it was a Jewish corpse to be buried in the cemetery. I told him I had some details and that I wanted to have a grave for my brother. The corpse arrived, and I can show you many newspaper clips reporting on my brother's funeral. 
which is interesting. This is the s some Jewish cemetery of Strasbourg, my hometown, where my family is, my, my uh, grandparents, official cemetery. So the Jewish community recuperated the corpse from this deposit, but they didn't bury them among the other Jews. They did what the uh, German Jews did in World War I. So they had a se separate carré, a separate um, part, with the heroes of deportation. So you had Jewish soldiers fallen for France, you know, fighting for free France, etc. You had Jews shot by German troops in France itself, and you had Jacques Felbeau. So I checked when I was in uh, Strasbourg last time, I, I checked that the, the, the grave is there. Okay, I'm too long, of course. Temporality, about that. I found uh, exhumation from 1945, post-Holocaust, post 45 to 93, but I'm sure we can find some later ones. This is a remarkable, very strange story of Jan Yado Weiss, who wanted to organize the exhumation of a group of camp inmates who died in a commando of, in Bohemia. He was uh, himself living in uh, upstate New York, where as a sole fighter for his cause. You know, he started this battle in 1987, and in 1991 he managed to have the entire, so it was a casket um, with all the remains mixed. Uh, he managed to have the casket exhumed, open, transferred, this is very strange, transferred to a, another casket, um, brought to Prague, where the local Jewish community had a ceremony, spent the night with the, with 1991, and then the casket arrived to Israel. And uh, so we have just very long, 45 minutes telling the story of this uh, transfer, Jado Weiss wants to uh, made a video of this achievement. So we have a, a complete video of you know the exhumation, the, the transfer, this you know uh, from one casket to the other, and Jado Weiss insisting to show the video. So you have a, a strange moment where he say, "Okay, you have to film my TV set." So he, t he tells he tell the. U USA Shoah Foundation, we say, and they don't want, they know, it's, we want you. We say, no, 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 I want you. And they say, okay, can you go faster, you know, <laughs> fast forward. Oh, no, 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 it's important. So we have, so I wonder if the, in the archive we have a copy of this film, you know, showing the, <laughs> showing the, the transfer. Question of money is detailed, you know, who paid for that. The question of diplomats being involved, various embassies to pass uh, the corpse through the borders. And Mr. Weiss insisting that only Orthodox rabbis in New York State and in Israel were interested in helping in this transfer. Conclusion, I have many points. I will go uh, really quick. Um, remaining wide open is the question of the dimension. So again, I don't know if it's a, a sample, a small sample of its much wider in, in those 52,000 testimonies. Um, I would say maybe there was no frame for collective memory, to quote from Maurice Alvax, you know, the, on collective memory, that would permit the expression, the story of exhumation to be told. Um, second, uh, I will not um, elaborate, but this problem of cremation of the Holocaust, and the question was not properly asked to survivors, uh, and also the attitude of interviewers towards the questions of exhumation varied widely. And third, the question of images, of photos. And you know, I showed you some of the photos I found. Uh, there were many more photos of graves, of memorials, of exhumations you know, themselves of body parts of skeleton uh, that we, we find in this video. It confirms one of the findings of the bigger pro project we had, uh, something we started with. It confirmed that on in the case of exhumations all over the world, it's, they are widely documented. So you have a lot of images. 
to the point that we discuss among us the, the existence of a visual culture of exhumations. But that remains an open question. I thank you for your attention. And of course, <laughs> did this. Are you taking questions? Oh. Okay. Yes, um, one of the questions I have is uh, regarding um, when it comes to noticing, noticing different patterns and how human remains are memorialized. I remember going to Cambodia for my study abroad, and I Okay, thank you for the question. This is the third um, part. You remember destruction, identification, uh, reconciliation, you know. Uh, so we published extensively on, you know, what once you have the remain or the bones, if you don't give them back to the family, because there's no family left, what do you do with them? And Cambodia is a spectacular um, example, Rwanda too. You know. a, a common feature we have found, and that's something I found also in the case of the Holocaust, is the, the disappearance of those human remains, mostly bones. So they are, in the first years after the massacres, they are very visible. So in Cambodia, they are in shrines. So they were in, in the center of the village, you had, you had piles of bones, Rwanda too. You know. And as time passes, you know, they are being covered, you know, they are being um, less and less shown, and finally they will disappear from public view. The example we have is Majdanek, the, uh, the um, memorial of Majdanek. And if, for those who have been there, if you remember, remember of all, in the, where you have the, the church that is in the building of the crematoria. Remember that you have a, a glass box, in fact, it's plastic box and inside you have a lot of bones half burnt and they are the bones found by the Soviet army when they enter Majdanek because the crematoria was still functioning you know the, the SS left in in a hurry and for years they were visible so you could see the and it's very graphic you know you have half uh, half a skeleton you know uh, with flesh decaying flesh and in 1970s, I don't know when exactly, it was painted. The glass is painted in, in, uh, in that. You have an urn in Auschwitz. The urn is still in the museum. Nobody noticed it. A big urn full of ashes. So you have, in the case of the Holocaust, I found many, I mean, people were living with those bones in post-war years, you know. And then the sensitivity changed and it seemed not appropriate anymore. Cultural, sorry, just the culture, of course, it, it's very di divergent from one culture to the other. But what we see is you have a cultural basis, and then you have the new rituals that have to be invented in the case of genocide or mass violence, because the normal rituals just don't function. function. They are made for individual funerals. When you have 3,000 corpses, you cannot perform the same rituals. So we interviewed, for example, the chief mufti of Bosnia. And he is very, very clear that he had to invent new funeral ritual after the war, because there were no women, uh, there were no men left, etc. So the, the basic of tradition. In the case of the Holocaust and the Jews, um, 
and I wrote about that, it was the transfer of ashes, using the ashes to commemorate. But the Jewish tradition is strongly against that. You cannot use the... So for the case of the Shoah Memorial in Paris, when they inaugurated the Shoah Memorial, there are ashes you know, on the crypt, still are, and first the rabbis, French rabbis, refused to attend the opening. Finally they came, but after weeks of... Uh, so you have a confrontation of old tradition, new tradition, and, and civilization, you know, the culture. Yeah, th thank you for the question. Yes, uh, you know, as I said, my, my um, impression or knowledge is that the liberated were, were picked up because they were confronted to the, the corpses. Not any GI who, who liberated Europe was interviewed. But again, I don't know, I didn't go, I just used the testimonies, I didn't go through the archives, it's fascinating. What is very clear in the narrative of those liberators is the question of masculinity. They, masculinity. they say, we were the strong man, we fought Hitler, we had no right to weep, to mourn, to collapse, but still we did. Still we did. And we have always, you know, not me of course, not the interviewer, but you know, I had a, I had a comrade, you know, he collapsed, he fainted, he, he could not stand the, the work he had to do. For the, um, for the Jewish survivors, I mean, it's not unexpected, they always had a moment of, a very emotional moment, the exhumation. You know? We know that the moment the survivors are emotional is very specific, you know, when they parted from their loved one or when they were reunited with their loved one. But in the case of so it's more like when they recognize the corpse. So yeah. We open the mass grave, and then I recognize the corpse of my father or, or my sister. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jean-Marc. Uh, in the beginning, I was intrigued of your f second slide. There was one uh, slight remark about uh, gender destruction of mm. corpses. And so I was wondering uh, if you can elaborate a little bit of this. And this brought me to the question also, so when you look at the testimonies, do you see a different narrative evolving from women telling these stories or a man? I don't know, gender, gender um, studies, you know, uh, that was a question we asked from the beginning. And I can say, we didn't find any difference in the tr treatment of corpse. So, so the, the, the female skeleton <coughs> or the male skeleton are, are treated the same way. What is gendered is the exhumations. So very often you have a, a woman wanting to recover the corpse. Then the, the man will take over. The forensics always is a, is a man. And then you have, think again of the materiality. You know. In the case of the, I described, it was made with very low tech. It's uh, your bare hand you were dugging to recover. Or you had a, um, do you say that? <laughs> um, a shelf. A, a, a shelf, and, and sh that's it, you know? And so, so that you had the, always a, a, a male peasant, farmer, you know, being paid or helping. Or the male undertaker, because it was seen as a, a work of little muscle and strength. For the case of you know, Bosnia and you know, more contemporary, then you have a lot of women because it's, it's a very high-tech lab work, DNA bank, etc. So of course, it's not the case of the Holocaust. But the narrative about, so from the testimonies, do women speak differently about this than men? I didn't find uh, any very any striking difference. I was wondering if there's any mention of the burial corpses in the memoirs of the survivors. I didn't personally read these. Were there not asked where these characters might have come up? Mm. But in memoirs where they might have, they feel like they're more in control of the narrative because it comes up. 
I, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that should be, you know, again, you know, the, in the masses of written testimony, it's a very good question. You know. What I found, I mean, not me, but thanks to Gabriel Finder, our friend, um, is that those exhumations are widely mentioned in the Yiskorbuch, Yiskorbuch, so the, the memorial book written by the community. But nobody noticed that it's uh, it there, you know. But there were like more collective exhumations being described. Uh, so you mentioned that the interviewers oftentimes didn't know what to ask or didn't necessarily follow up. But I wonder when do these narratives about corpses or exhumation come up at all during the interviews? They come in the chronology. So I came back. Well, very often before leaving Poland, you know, so I think before leaving, I had the last duty to to do, put my mother in the Jewish cemetery. Then I, I could leave, but it was never a question asked. Did you recover the corpse? You know? Thank you. So I'm wondering how exhumation is seen in the Jewish tradition, and I'm asking this because in the Christian tradition or in Christian cemeteries, you buy a grave for 10 years, 15 years, and that's it. By contrast, in a Jewish cemetery, you buy a grave forever, and the dead body cannot be bothered anymore. So then how is the exhumation seen? So this is also the, the, the common knowledge, you know, for you know, for those secular Jews, when they know very little about Jewish traditions, they will say, I know exhumations are, are banned, you know, yeah, forbidden in Jewish tradition. In fact, it's, it's a bit more complicated because I went to the Jewish text, you know, with the Shulran Arur, 16th century, which is the code of the most achieved and still used code of, of Jewish law. Again, it's not tradition, no? you have to dif differentiate. It's really the legal, the legal aspect, the very legalistic aspect of, uh, of Jewish uh, religion. And you have five conditions, five reasons that will, for which the uh, rabbi can give the permission to exhume. And one is to give individual, uh, the individual grave. Second is to bury in a Jewish cemetery when it's not, the corpse is not in a Jewish cemetery, it's in the wild. Uh, third, when the grave is threatened by war, uh, destruction, even natural catastrophe, you know, then you can save the, the, the corpse. Um, so there are many reasons to give the permission. And what you see, and it's also something we studied, not myself, I cannot access the text uh, in Hebrew, but we study, is that the, the rabbis, orthodox rabbis, after the Holocaust, when asked, you know, had very, a trouble to give a definitive answer. You see that the, the, they didn't know what, what to do. Of course, it was such a new dimension of, of death and, and catastrophe. So in the first 10 years after the Holocaust, roughly speaking, they gave the permission. You know, in the name, you know, individual grave, give a Jew, proper Jewish funeral, also it's important, the rituals. And then from 55, 66 on, uh, they say no. Don't don't do it. What the position is now? You know, and so if you ask the chief rabbi, I interviewed the chief rabbi of Poland. Uh, I ask him, and he say, you know, the first answer is no. And then we discuss, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's also he's an American. Uh, he said no. It's uh, uh, and then we discuss f individual cases, you know. Um, so it's, um, but this idea, this perception of that the, the, the grave has to remain for eternity, should remain untouched, you know, this is the Jewish tradition, has been all forever, etc. to the country of, you know, Christian tradition, uh, and even the cremation, you know. Um, this is something that pertain into the interviews, e even uh, among, again, you know, very secular, secular Jews. Photo of the man carrying the remains behind the mayor of the of the city. 
And then as we were talking about the visual culture of exhibitions, I'm wondering about the role of movement in, because exhumation, I mean, is to, part of it is to move these bodies. And the images that we have of the corpses of the Holocaust are very static mm -hmm. ones of just these piles of, of um, objects. And even in testimonies that I've watched, although I haven't searched for exhumation, the kind of materiality that you describe in the people talking about the smell of the corpses and stuff, it's, I just was watching a testimony by a liberator in the last week and the liberator is talking about it almost like it's just the state of the place that it that there is this smell that it's not even connected to like the actual the actual bodies and so I wonder in the visual culture of exhumation um, how big a role movement plays in that or is it of course the very act of recording a moment you know makes it still, but, um, or even in the testimonies that you've watched, people are talking about, you know, rec these, these moments of recognition, are they also talking about moments of handling or moving or, you know, um, or Yeah, I mean, yes, movement. Obviously, you don't have many videos of moving images in this collection, um, you have you know, the maximum I found were five photos in a row, you know, uh, the DPs. But the DPs, they will show a movement. So the photo will really document, you know, corpsing being you know, in the grave, then being lifted, then being transported, and then finally being reburied. Even with still images, a kind of reportage. You know. So this idea of movement is very, very present. For the images we know, for example, Bergel Benzen, Bergel Bergel Benzen, you know, they are captioned from moving images, you know, like the the bulldozer moves. You know, the images. You know, we think it's a photo. In fact, it's a caption from along the you know the famous reels made by the, the British troops. And uh, we have studied the way they have been edited and you know, what has been shown and um, and not. Um, problem of the visual culture, uh, I'm not very certain that the term is really good, is that uh, for a culture, the photos must be shown, <laughs> you know. And obviously, those photos are, I show you, I'm showing you, I showed you, have, have not been shown. You know, they are kept in the the cupboard of the survivor. But what I find striking is that they exist. I found interesting that you worked a lot with the photographs in the archive. And uh, so when they, since this is at the end of the interview, they show the photographs mm -hmm. and they talk about this. So what is the kind of what are they talking about when they show the photographs? Is it to document the crime, or is it to remember their relatives, or what is the main kind of narrative there? You know, th those, those um, survivors, they, have the, they are also the historians of their own story. You know, this is also one of the bias of the, they want to show the photos. But very often, you know, I've interviewed many survivors.